Hi there, Section 14. Finally getting around to making you a video. And um, if I could just editorialize, um, um, I, I just made you a video. And I was, you know, it takes a while to craft one of these things, right? Um, it takes a minimum of a half an hour. It's going to be a half an hour video, and you don't need to know this, but I made an entire video. I started editing it, and there was just no sound. And I'm like, what in the world? I turned on my expensive professional grade lavalier mic and um, in moving my camera around because I had to teach a live class today in Staples, I, um, I, I accidentally tapped, hit the mute button, the mute switch on the top of the thing. So I made this beautiful video that is um, silent. And what are you supposed to do? Read my lips as the deaf do? So I'm going to make it again uh, because it's Wednesday and I got to get you some gear and I'll bet this will be even better. Um, we try to talk about everything I just talked about. It's pretty fresh in my mind. Um, and don't worry, that one got interrupted by my wife calling me, so there's flaws in it, and it's just as well. God wants me to make a new one. R real quickly, uh, the highlight of my day, I don't know what your highlight was, but my highlight uh, today happened when uh, I looked up in the middle of one of my favorite classes, my humanities classes. I'm teaching, I got 28 students in the palm of my hand, kind of, and they're all listening to me, and I look up. And I, in the in the door of my classroom, there's a little you know thin piece of glass, a little window. And I looked up, and there was the face, the gaze of Grant Zupko, who was my student six seven years ago. I think he's from Aiken. Uh, took my comp one, comp two class, and I, I'm like, are you kidding? Get in here! I love that guy. I haven't seen him in years. And he comes flying into the room with a couple of academic advisors. He was visiting the college, right, and his mom in town. We did like this running hug thing in the middle of the class. My students are like, what's happening? And the reason why it was uh, fairly dramatic is I, I thought Grant, Grant was a law enforcement student. And um, I thought he was a cop in Aiken. And he's actually um, now a member of the Secret Service. He guards the president in the White House. And he brought his was wearing his entire uniform with a bulletproof vest and a gun and everything. He looks magnificent. And I was so happy to see him. Hugged him two, three times, and um, then he started telling some stories and swearing, so I had to get him out of there. And um, anyway, that doesn't, I'm not putting down online teaching, or maybe I am. I, you guys know this is hard for me, but that's going to happen with a face to face class, right? With a, where a student circles back to um, say hello, hello, and hug me. Um, maybe it could happen with, a, with an online class. Maybe it'll happen with this one. Um, Maybe not, but anyway, I'm still going to, uh, here I am reshooting a bit, so I'm proving I'm, I'm, I'm really trying. Uh, what do I got for you today? I want to talk about an experience I had reading the journals, um, your journals and the journals of my live students. And I'm going to kind of, um, for a little while, I'm not going to be talking necessarily about comp one or writing, but life, if, if I could. Reading the writing and the thoughts of uh, young people, anyone, any student, is a responsibility and a privilege that I take very seriously. I mean, imagine what I know about people. And most of the stuff that people are telling me are things that have to do with the chorus, what we're reading, what we're writing, what we're wondering about. And sometimes self-expressive writing can um, uh, lead people to tell me things. Sometimes you open up a journal entry and there's light, and sometimes there's darkness. And I think it's the darkness that I want to kind of focus on and try to explain. And I'll come up with concrete examples in a minute. Uh, to help you uh, get it. And uh, that's thing one. And then thing two is I, I want to approach the idea of human suffering from two angles. And I'm going to use my take on it and I'm going to get the help of a writer that you've, whose name you've never heard of before and will never hear again, a guy named Tyconius. And then I want to show you the crescendo moment from Chris Abani's poetry reading in November at CLC for my Verse Like Water series. That Nigerian poet um, really stunned. The first uh, live, full reading that I've had since before life. And I want to take you to that moment. I, I took all the gear and I made a little film about it using my stuff. And it's only five minutes long and I'll probably trim some of that to get it going even faster. Uh, maybe not. And I really hope you pay attention to what I want to tell you about suffering today because we all take our turns with it. And then I want you to pay attention to a bigger, better teacher. I know when to get help. And we're kind of talking about the same thing using different terms. Then I'd like to tell you what I want to talk about tomorrow when I get back up to Staples because i got to get these classes sort of linked up. Tomorrow with them and with you today, I'd like you to glimpse where we're going with uh, rhetorical theory. And um, 
sounds like my wife has started taking a shower. If you can hear that, um, that's probably too much information. Do we still say TMI? I think so. So let's think of it this way. When, when you pick up a student's journal, you can hear good things. And I did, I did read good things. I had a student tell me, um, Johnson, I got a girlfriend. I finally got a girlfriend. And I'm like, yes, way to go. Good, good for you. Hold on tight, I wrote. And uh, I, I had another student, uh, many students, tell me about trips that they took over the break. And um, she's not going to be able to shower during videos yeah, again. Um, just ignore that. If, you can hear, if I can hear it, the lavalier mic is probably picking it up. I'm in trouble tonight. Um, uh, anyway, I heard wonderful things. And I also saw, witnessed students telling me things that were hard, that I have to bear up, right, and carry with me and witness, because that's my job. And I get more sensitive and I get more empathetic as I, as I get older, not less. I thought it would run the other way when I was a young man. Not so, my heart's getting bigger. So for example, there's a student in this course who uh, took the time to type out an, most of an entire page on how hard it's been to have Crohn's disease. And I read that, and of course I'm not gonna say the name of the student. I went, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that happened to you. Good thing they're, they're, you know, they're getting it dialed in. I had another precious student of mine uh, who I've worked with in two or three classes. Name starts with an M. Uh, she told me in her journal that she has the suspicion that she's losing one of the best and only friends that she has in her life. And, well, that made me sad. Uh -huh. Sorry. And um, I think one of the more poignant moments for me was when a student told me that over break, and he saw it coming and I saw it coming too because he told me about it. He told me that his dad sat him down. I don't, he didn't tell me where, but I imagine the kitchen table because we are Minnesotans and that's where we do business. His dad sat him down and told him that he loved his mother, but he didn't want to be married to her anymore. And that they were going to start move, making the moves on, on a, the divorce. And this young man wrote in his journal, Johnson, this stays between you and I. And I said, absolutely. Only once in 13 years at CLC, have I had to break confidentiality? And that happened with a young man a few years ago who let me know in his journal, in an early journal, that he had spent the summer, um, this is hard to talk about and hard to hear, he had spent the summer catching, killing, and mutilating small mammals. And I thought, okay, that's a little thing called psychopathy. Um, maybe you know, if I could editorialize again. I got a few campaigns going in my life. One of the things that serial killers have in common, two things for sure, they all have killed and harmed animals. That's step one, really, uh, to bodies in a trunk. And almost to a serial killer, they have all consumed vast amounts of porn, uh, porn pornography, which I consider to be evil. I took a look at that page and I thought, oh, well, let's get you some help, kid whose name starts with L. And I did. Um, and I broke confidentiality. I, I gathered, I wanted to call the National Guard, but I gathered our emergency crew that's headed up by Mary Sam some sweet people that get together sometimes when students are in crisis. And they said to him, why did you tell Jeff Johnson all these things? And he said that he's the only teacher I trusted. We got him psychiatric help. He spent a year meeting once a week with Joy Larson, our head of security, who I have a Mount Hagen terms with. And he's fine, he's just fine. He took up a, weld, a life as a welder. He got a certificate, uh, certificate of welding from uh, the CLC. He's married, I can see it on Facebook. Um, and I hope he becomes a father soon. Just because you're a psychopath doesn't mean uh, you're, you're a murderer. In general, they make uh, outstanding administrators. I'm sorry, my phone is Bluetooth paired to my head. This is my, my wife called with a previous video. This is my mom. Mama. Jeff, yeah, hi. Hey, mom, I'm in the middle of making a video, okay? Can I call you back in a little of while? Of course. Yeah, you bet. Okay. All right, I'll call you in about half an hour. Love you. Okay, bye. I can't win tonight. Gotta, gotta answer it. When your 93-year-old mother picks up, calls, you gotta pick up. So, to cut to it, with the young man especially, he provoked this entire thing. It only takes one or two sentences from a student's journal to create an entire segment for class. When that student let me know, I'm suffering, Johnson, I'm suffering. My first thoughts, as you can imagine, are how can I help? How can I palliate this? And I'd like to mingle two ideas now that are really similar, although different at the same time. 
to loan you a way of thinking about suffering when you take your turn with it, because we all do. And um, I'm going to go to a 4th century book written by a church father named Tychonius. I'm holding a book uh, called Tychonius' Exposition on the Apocalypse. Tychonius was a writer that lived in the desert. And he wanted to, uh, exposition means an explaining, right? Some of you might know, whether you see it as a sacred text as I do, or as great world literature, if you're a non-believer. I'm clapping for everybody, and I love everybody. I just proved I, could, I loved a psychopath. Um, the Apocalypse is the 73rd book of the Bible, the last one. The hallucinatory book dreamed into being by John, uh, the only apostle who wasn't martyred brutally. And he wrote that, I believe when he was an old man, on the island of Patmos uh, during the reign of Nero, a, a Roman emperor who was the worst uh, in terms of being crazy and a maniac. And the book of Revelation, as it's also called, is a, a, an imagining of the end of the world. Although the word apocalypse actually, which I think we're living through, the beginnings of it anyway, the word apocalypse actually means unveiling or a, a, a revealing. So Tychonius says crazy stuff in this book, but what it's really helping me understand is something I've only begun to get late in life. Suffering and joy, especially good and evil. Let's talk about that because I believe in both. Those are, not, those are real to me. They're not constructs. And um, you're going to hear me talk about it more than once because I'm such a moralist. Tychonius has helped me fully understand that good and evil are bound together. It's shoulder to shoulder. They coexist. They're baked into the same cake, and they always will be until it comes out clear. This is illustrated across the Bible, Old and New Testament, but most of deeply, most adroitly, in that story about the wheat and the tares. Right? Maybe you know it. This farm, this field worker goes to the guy who owns the field, and he says, "Hey, the wheat's coming up, but so are the weeds. Should I tear up the weeds?" The farmer, the farmer dude, the guy who owns it all, says, "Don't. Maybe don't. If you pull up the weeds now, you're going to pull up the wheat." wait until the wheat is ready to be harvested, then we'll separate them and pull them both. And I, 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 lo I love that idea. That um, you know, gives me a lot of hope. Now let's, I'm going to go to a bigger, better uh, teacher right now. I'm going to go to Dr. Chris Abani and show you just a few minutes from the November poetry reading. And this is really the crescendo moment, okay? This is the moment where a young girl, I think from uh, possibly Pine River, yeah, Pine River, she was nervous. Oh, and I freaked during the reading because, and if you ever come, I sure hope you come on poetry, to my poetry readings. Extra credit is available to you too. Shameless extra credit. He freaked me out during the reading because at, at all poetry readings have something called the, the two-poem warning. It's like the two-minute warning in football, except it's a two-poem warning. Every poetry reading has this. The poet will say something along the lines of, okay, a couple more poems, two more poems. It lets the audience know, wow, it's almost over. The poet's letting us go, and we need to let the poet go. And sweet Chris Abani pulled the, the trigger on the two-poem morning at like 27 minutes after 12. And I thought, wait a minute. We talked about a 45-minute reading, maybe a 50-minute reading. But he knew what he was doing because he's a genius, and I'm a non-genius. At a glance, he took a look at the crowd and could see so many young people that he realized it would be better to have it be mostly half poetry and then half com conversation and Q&A. And this woman from uh, um, PRB, trembling like a leaf and also courageous, put her hand up and she was the first question. And she wanted to ask him about um, suffering. What do you do when you're suffering? What do you do when you feel like you're stuck in a log and you know you have to get out but you don't know how? And she had no idea that she was asking a question about suffering <clears throat> of a man who in the 80s was imprisoned by the Nigerian military police for three years, including one year in solitary confinement, where he not only didn't see or speak to a human soul, it was a year of darkness. They fed him at night, so he would go crazy, and he very nearly did. So again, to repeat the idea that that, that young woman had no idea that Chris, Chris abani has got a PhD in suffering as well as a PhD in um, literature. I want you to meet him. Try to concentrate on it. And don't, don't brush through this. You can blow off my poetry sometimes, but don't, don't miss this. Watch it.
your hands in the air if you are attending your very first poetry reading. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. All right. <clears throat> that's a beautiful question. Did you hear the question? The question was, um, as someone myself who, who understands pain and difficulty and sometimes gets trapped in, think of it as a hole in a log and how, what happens if you stay there too long and you're afraid to come out, but you know you need to come out. Um, this is always the, the most difficult thing. And also, you know, the beautiful, I use the word beauty in ways I think people find startling because I think what is beautiful contains both what is pretty and what is ugly because something to be truly beautiful, it has to have the potential to transform. So here's what I would, I would give you two answers. The first is a general answer, and the second I'll make it a little bit more specific. <clears throat> if you know anything about Christianity, then you know about Jesus' crucifixion, yes? So you, you understand this idea that here is what you can think of as a creature of sublimeness, like a creature of divinity. And this creature has to subject itself to this journey, this very difficult journey. So the journey from Pilate's, from when Pilate sort of condemns Jesus through the streets is absolute torture. In fact, in, if you've seen Game of Thrones, the shame scene, you, you have to imagine that Jesus was the first shame scene, right? He has to lug his own cross up there, then he's nailed to it, then he has all this power that he can't use it, and then he has to die, and then he goes to hell for three days before he can resurrect. And so the, the mystery of all of that stuff is sort of an explanation for life, which is that we all have to go through the journey of the grotesque in order to attain grace, right? In order to be able to even claim uh, the sublime. So here's the thing about hollowed out logs. Because the log is hollowed out, it's already rotten. That's the trick of it. Once you realize that the log itself, in order for it to be hollow, is already rotten, it's less of a coffin and more of a blanket. And if you can just make that quick switch, then you just start with your fingernail, scratching away at the top. You don't have to do anything more than that and just let little pricks of light fall in. And when it doesn't burn the skin anymore, find a way to slide out. But when you're coming out, be sure you've asked for someone to be there. Just as Magdalene had to meet Jesus, be sure to ask for someone to be there. So that when you come out of the, the log, you get an embrace. Does that help? This is um, a verse from the Holy Ifa book called Ogbewate. So first I'll do it in Yoruba and then I'll give a rough translation. Leke leke Obi wori yere nture yere nture Adefa fomba bagba la kodi Nikba ti mun fojo kureni bareni Oniko orobo orobo Ifa niku niku o moti di bagba la kodi La kodi ni mo wawo Ikba odun leni niku niku Moti di bagba la kodi La kodi ni mo wawo Ikba odun leni niku niku Moti di bagba la kodi La kodi ni mo wawo Elegantly and beautifully does the egret make its way through the mud, the crest on its head bobbing Yerenture, Yerenture, was divined for the man who wanted to be the father of the inner shrine, to know the deepest secrets of the universe. And if I said to him, oh, it's so easy, behold the cattle egret, it stalks through the mud and remains pure all the time. Even if it spends 200 years in the mud, it will always break for light. And when it does, there is no mud on it. It is always pure. This is how we remain eternal. This is how we remain deathless. Always break for light. Carry no impurity, even if you live in it for 200 years. Thank you so much, Kurosawani. Wasn't that something? I love that man. And uh, I got quite a poet hug from him when we released each other. Um, 
I always get the poet hug. That's what I live for. And but it, we, were, we weren't hugging each other when we said goodbye. We were holding each other, kind of swaying a little bit because we are brothers now. After just two days of hanging out. Okay, now here's one more thing today. I don't want this to get too long. Tomorrow, <clears throat> when I go up to Staples, <clears throat> I want to get them <clears throat> thinking about the origins of classical rhetoric. And I want to get you thinking about it now, too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. I don't teach a class without this thermos. And so here's how it goes online, right? I can't simulate it. We can't have the conversation. So a lot of it is like, okay, here's what I talked about yesterday. Here's how it went. And in this case, it's like, here's what I'm going to do tomorrow. And I'll, I'll, um, it, it's, it, it'll, it'll work. It's worked before. It's the best I can do. So tomorrow, basically, I'm going to do like this tripartite, three-part thing uh, where I get these students and you uh, thinking about classical rhetoric or its origins. Two are apocryphal. One, for certain, is historical. And the, the method is the same every time. I've been doing this for years. I'll pick out a couple kids. You know, like tomorrow I'll pick out <clears throat> Luke and Gabe just as examples. And I'll say, okay, class, we're going to go back in time. Any Wayne Worlds fans? And I'm going to say, okay, I want you to imagine about 20,000 years ago, Gabe comes out of the woods and he is hungry. And uh, Luke comes out of the woods and they meet each other. But the difference between them is that Luke is walking along with this big, beautiful apple. And Gabe sees that and it's like, wow, I'm, I'm hungry. And then I ask the class, what happens next? And they're all like, what? And they'll have to say, give me a scenario. Tell me what happens next. Almost every time, 13 years at CLC, 36 total, I've been doing, this is an old trick. The whole room just goes straight to violence. Um, Luke, uh, Gabe sees Luke with the apple and just beats him up and takes it. And I'm like, okay, thanks for going straight to, 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 to bloodshed. I thought you people were nice. Just being satirical. That's not rhetoric, I tell my students. That is just violence. There's no persuasion there, there's no cooperation, there's no collaboration. Once in a while a student will come and say, well, you know, maybe Luke could say, um, or Gabe could say, I see you've got an apple. I, I know where some berries are and a friend of mine ate them and he didn't die. We could, I could show you where the berries are, you could show me where the apples grow and we could go fishing maybe and, you know, have a balanced diet and evolve. That's starting to sound like rhetoric to me. Then I got to pick out another kid, uh, for example, number two. There's a kid in that room with a mythological name, Odin. And I'm going to say to Odin, Odin, how old are you? He'll probably say 16 or 17. And I'll say, Odin, where were you about 16 and a half years ago when you were six months old? Do you remember what you were doing? And the kid will be like, no. And I'll say, well, you'll remember this, Odin. You'd been sleeping. It's an afternoon class, so this will be perfect. It was an afternoon, and you, 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 took, you took a nap, a long one. And you woke up after a while, and you were in trouble, man. Problem one was that you were starving. You were just hungry. Problem two is that you had pooped in your pampers, diapers, and uh, your butt was starting to itch, man. Do you remember what you did then? And Owen says, I cried. I cried out. And I said, that's right. You cried out. Because you knew that if you cried... A beautiful woman or maybe your father or someone or grandma, someone would come in there and clean you up and get you in a high chair and get you a sippy cup and some Cheerios and life would be good again for a little while until you re-pooped. Uh, little kids, a couple of you are parents, you know that uh, the babies poop and pee uh, 2,000 times in the first 10 months. That's no reason not to have children, trust me. Um, I wish I had a big family and only two boys walked into the room. I already told you that. That is rhetoric, okay? Before Odin or any of us even could speak, before we knew our names, we knew we could act on the world and the world would act on us and respond. It's a, it's a, it's a thing. It just goes back and forth. It's a continuum. We are always acting on the world with language and the world is always acting on us. It never stops. Now, the third example is actually historical. In the 8th century before Christ, on a hard scrabble agrarian island called Syracuse, there was a real tyrant who took over the island and trashed all the public records. Again, about 800 BC. And a little thing about tyrants or supervisors, if you got one, everybody who, who gets any power wants history to begin with them. I've seen this all my life. 
And that was a real problem that he trashed all the public records. Before, before the peasants rose up and killed him, or when that happened, the problem was that with no public records, nobody knew who owned what. The boundary lines were, were fuzzy, all meets and bounds, right? This boulder and that tree, etc. And to get their land back, some farmers had to argue before the proverbial uh, tribunal of elders. And there was a guy named Corax of Syracuse, a merchant, who was a pretty smart guy who recognized that the farmers weren't very good at arguing in public. They couldn't argue from causes. And he set up the first school of rhetoric. He started training the farmers to speak in public. He said, okay, listen, when you go, some things like when you go in there, say this, argue in this way, use this as an example, use this hand gesture, etc." And he was the first teacher likely of rhetoric. Those farmers were his first student. Everybody won. They got their land back. Uh, Korax made a drachma or two. And he was the first teacher that uh, ever aspired to teach people how to speak with grace and eloquence because that is a form of power, although also a very solemn responsibility, and we'll make that clear as we go along. That's the beginning of our rhetorical training. I'll be back at it tomorrow or Friday with another vid, and I will not have any interruptions whatsoever. No moms will call, um, or wives, or maybe they'll both call. Love you guys, and see you soon. Uh, journal entries are gonna be due Sunday night. I'll get those up. Also get you up something to read, and I'll get um, it's. Uh, it is 7:14. I should get this edited and up uh, on D2L pretty soon. It would have been earlier if I didn't have to shoot it twice. Bless you. See you soon.